Hi everybody and welcome back to room 9, our region's largest classroom. My name is Miss St. Louis and I'm a teacher at Rogers Elementary School in the Melville School District. And we are located in South St. Louis County. Today I'm here to teach a reading lesson that's geared towards students who are in the third grade. But all learners are more than welcome to join and explore with us. So let's get started! This week we have been talking about all things author's purpose. So author's purpose is the reason behind why an author chose to write something, right? Whether it's a book or an article or a commercial or a script, right? They had a reason why they chose to write it. And yesterday we talked all about persuasion as one of the reasons why they, an author might choose to write something. So to remind you, persuasion is when the author is trying to get you to do or try something. Okay, but that's not the only reason why someone might write a book, right? Authors may also write in order to inform, right? So informing is when the author is trying to give you information or to teach you something. So let's stick this one up there. Oops. All right, so, so far we have persuasion and inform, right? Now inform. What word does that kind of sound like? Yeah, it sounds like information, right? So in a book that has the purpose to inform us, we're going to be given information, right? So examples might be some newspaper articles, right? Or magazine articles that are trying to teach us about things. Um, Nonfiction books are also really good examples. Biographies and autobiographies, right, are trying to teach us about people and the way in which they lived their lives and the things that they did. So there's a lot of books out there that have to inform us, right? If you think about nonfiction, think about all the different things we can learn from nonfiction. We can learn about animals, we can learn about places, we can learn about medicine, we can learn about so many things, right? Think about the books in your school. There's a lot of nonfiction books in your school, right? And maybe even some textbooks, right? We have math books that teach us math and history books that teach us about historical events, right? So many books that we have in our school are there to teach us, right? They were written to help give us information and to help teach us new things with the purpose to inform the reader, right? So when we read informational books, right, we have our own purpose, our own reason why we're reading them, right? That might be to learn some new information, right? If I'm going to take a trip to another country, I might buy books about that country to learn all about that country and to learn, hmm, well, here's some things I could do there. Here are some really cool places I could go, some new foods to try, even learn about the language right? Um, if I am going to have a new job, I might have to read some books about that new job, right? So books can definitely give us new information. We can also read books to help us answer a question, right? So if I have a question that pops up in my life, I could find a book um, that could help to answer that question and read it to hopefully find the answer, right? For example, Doctors probably do this all the time, right? There are so many medical books out there that can help doctors to answer questions, right? If a patient comes in and they have some symptoms that they've never seen before, they might have to go out and research a little bit to help figure out exactly what might be wrong with you and the best treatment possible, right? Same thing goes with um, our zookeepers, right? If a brand new animal shows up at the zoo, our zookeepers might have to do a little bit of research to help answer some questions about the animal. What do they like to eat? What kind of environment should they live in, right? So we can help to answer some questions that come up in our own daily lives. For example, the other day, ugh, my car tires were showing up that they were low on pressure and I couldn't figure out how I was supposed to fix that. So I had to go out, get my car manual, and read it to answer that question, right? Didn't have to read the whole book, thankfully. It's a really long book. But I was able to get to the exact section in there using my table of contents. 
and I was able to figure out what pressure my tires should be at, how I should fix them, and everything I needed to know. So even little things that we have around in the house that we don't think about, like manuals, can help us to give us information, right? Or teach us about new things. So today we are going to be reading a nonfiction book that's gonna help us to teach us a few more, a little bit more information. Are you ready to get started? Let's go. All right, so our book today is called Amazing Animal Babies, written by Kay Barnum and illustrated by Maddie Frost. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, haven't we read this book before? It looks really familiar. Well, we haven't read this book before, but we've read a similar book by the same author and illustrator. A couple weeks ago, we read the book, A Wonderful World of Weather. And in this book, we learned about all different types of weather. So what do you think we might learn about in this book? Yeah, different animal babies. And we can already see some different animal babies on the front. Elephants, tigers, we see some turtles, ooh, a dog and some mice, lots of different animals. We even have our own little animal here. So when I read nonfiction books, we've talked about this before, about how nonfiction books have text features that help us to read those books. And one of the text features that we've talked about in nonfiction books is the glossary. Now the glossary can be found at the back of the book and it's kind of like a mini dictionary, but the words in this glossary are specific to the words in this book. So a book about amazing animal babies probably won't have words that relate to things like tools or uh, history facts, right? We're not going to see any of those in here. But what I like to do when I read a book that's going to give me new information, I like to read the glossary first. I know that seems kind of silly. Why would I start at the back of the book? I know, silly, right? Well, I like to start at the back of the book to read the glossary. That way, as I'm reading the book and I come across those words, I already have an idea of what the definition is and when I read the sentences that have those words that are usually marked, right? They're bolded, they're underlined, they're highlighted. I can start to put two and two together and really begin to understand what that word means. So let's check out our glossary. Okay, the first word we have is hatch. Ooh. And that means to come out of an egg. So a lot of animals, right? Birds, turtles, those are a few animals that hatch. Now a litter is a group of baby animals that are born at the same time, right? So we know that something like dogs, dogs are born in a litter. So when my Winnie here was born, she was born as part of a litter. Now mammals are animals that are warm blooded and they feed their young with milk. Most mammals have live young, right? So humans are an example of a mammal. Now markings are patterns on an animal bar, an animal's body. Can you think of any animals that have specific markings? Yes, some dogs have markings, right? If you think about a Dalmatian, they have those spots that really help us to identify them. What else? Yes, tigers, zebras, all of those are animals that have markings. Now a pouch is a pocket of skin on the stomachs of some animals that is used to carry their babies. Hmm, I can think of one very popular animal that has a pouch. Do you know what I'm thinking of? You're right, it's a kangaroo. That is an animal that has a pouch that they use to carry their babies. Now, next up, we have the word predators, and those are animals that hunt and eat other animals. Hmm, what are some predators you can think of? Yes, lions are predators. Bears. Sharks, yes, those are all really good predators. Now, reptiles are animals such as snakes and lizards that are cold-blooded and have scales. 
most reptiles lay eggs. Okay? And shocks are when you are suddenly surprised. And survive means to stay alive. So as we're reading, we'll see if we come across any of those words, and then we can talk a little bit more about how they were used in that sentence. Are you ready to learn about some amazing animal babies? Well, let's go. Did you know that there are millions of different kinds of animals? All kinds of animals have babies. Animal babies depend on their parents for food and safety. They need to grow and learn the skills they need to survive. There's one of our vocab words, survive, right? So they need to learn some skills to grow and survive. Let's see what those skills might be. Some animals have live babies. Most of these animals are called mammals. Live young come from their mother's bodies. They breathe right away. A tall giraffe gives birth standing up. The baby falls towards the ground head first. This shocks the baby into taking its first breath. Right, so remember that shock is that sudden surprise. Right, so that drop is what's going to surprise the giraffe and help him to take his very first breath. A baby zebra can stand after only a few minutes. And this is important because it needs to be able to run from predators. Ooh, if we look at that zebra, do we see a predator anywhere? Yeah, we have uh, maybe a lion or a tiger that's hiding back there. Other animals, such as birds and most reptiles, lay eggs. The baby animal inside the egg keeps growing until it is ready to hatch. A male emperor or penguin keeps an egg warm for weeks until it hatches. Birds, frogs, turtles, crocodiles, and most fish and snakes lay eggs. Millions of dinosaurs, <laughs> I said that wrong, millions of years ago, dinosaurs laid eggs too. All right, so look at all these animals and their eggs. Now I know that maybe some of you have even gotten to see the egg hatching process, right? At school, maybe you had some chicks, right? That you watched grow up. I know that some of the classes at my school have had the opportunity to have some chicks in their classroom that start as eggs and grow and watch them until they hatch and become little baby chicks. How cool is that? Some animal babies look like their parents. They are just much smaller. Tiger babies, called cubs, have the same orange fur and dark stripes as their parents. Hmm. Snow leopard cubs have the same markings as adult snow leopards. They are also born with the same thick coats and large paws. Can you think of any other animals when they're born that look a lot like their parents? Yes, humans look a lot like their parents when they're born, just a little smaller. Lions look very similar to their parents, absolutely. Yes, giraffes and zebras, right? Those are all animals that look very similar to their parents when they're born, okay? Now, some animal babies look very different from their parents. A baby frog is called a tadpole. It has a long wiggly tail, but as weeks pass, it grows four legs. Its tail shrinks and goes away. Now it's a frog that looks like its parents. A baby swan is called a cygnet. These cygnets have brown fluffy feathers, but they will become long necked swans. They will grow feathers like their parents. So we can see that these guys, they definitely don't look like their parents in the beginning, but they grow to look a lot more like their parents as time goes on. Now, some animal babies need a lot of care. A baby koala is called a joey. When it is born, a joey cannot see or hear. It crawls into its mother's pouch and stays there for about six months. Even when it leaves the pouch, the joey stays with its mother until it's around one year old. Now, why do 
do you think that these pouches, that these moms have their pouches, what's the importance of having that pouch? Yeah, safety, right? So if you think about it, this baby koala, it can't see or it can't hear. Is it going to be able to see if there are predators around? No, it's not. So that with that mom having that pouch, right, that's going to help keep the baby safe until they are able to see and hear and help to identify if there is any danger present. Baby kangaroos are called joeys too. They also grow inside their mother's pouches. Newborns are as small as jelly beans. What? That's so small. Think about a little, a little jelly bean. And some kangaroos grow up to be even as tall as people. That's a lot of growing. A few animal babies do not need care from their parents. They are ready to survive on their own from the very beginning. Baby sea turtles hatch alone, then they run to the ocean. Some snakes give birth to live young. Others lay eggs, but almost all snakes leave their babies to look after themselves. They probably have to grow up pretty fast, huh? Yeah, gotta make sure they're ready for in case any predators come along. Now, animal babies need food to grow bigger and stronger. Bats feed their babies milk for a few weeks. Then the babies learn to find their own food. Some eat insects and others eat fruit. A baby orangutan drinks its mother's milk for years. Sometimes it drinks its mother's milk until it is more than eight years old. Adult orangutans mostly eat fruit. So we know that human babies, right, will drink their mother's milk or formula, which is um, a man-made alternative that's very similar to, for to a mother's milk, right? And we drink that for the first year or two of our lives. And then we begin to eat um, more solid foods and things that we find. Now, we don't usually just eat fruit, right, or even insects to keep us healthy. Right. Although some people do, right? But we have a very large diet of different foods that we can have because we're lucky enough to have a really big supply around us of different types of foods. Now, some animals need fat on their bodies to keep them warm. Animal babies must grow the body fat that they need. Seals do not have enough body fat as babies. They huddle together to stay warm with their mothers to find food. Now that fat that they have around them, that's called blubber. So there are quite a few animals out there that also have blubber, right? Think about a walrus, right? They have those thick layers of fat that help to keep them warm when they're in these very cold Arctic waters, right? And so we know from our own experience, if it's really, really cold and Let's say we forgot our jacket at home because sometimes the weather here, it goes from really warm to really cold really fast, even in just a day. We might have to get closer to other people to keep us warm, right? That act of all of us being together and giving off our body heat is something that's going to help us stay a little bit warmer than if we were on our own. See, animals do that too. Now, ocean waters can be very, very cold. A sea otter carries her pup on her chest for two months. And this keeps the pup cozy and warm. Now that looks like a comfortable way to travel, don't you think? Absolutely. Animals keep their babies safe from predators. Sometimes adult elephants form a circle around their babies called calves. The circle guards the calves from lions and hyenas. The antelope keeps her baby hidden during the day while she searches for food. So these are some of their survival techniques that they use to help protect their young. We know that when um, animals or people, when we're younger, right, we're still learning. We're still learning how to take care of ourselves and how to protect ourselves. So these animals have learned 
right? Different ways to help keep their young protected, whether that's hiding them or creating a circle around them to protect them. Many animal babies learn by playing. Wolf babies are called pups. They fight with each other just for fun, but they are also learning fighting skills that they'll need as they get older. A bear fight can be very noisy, when, but when bear cubs play fight, they are quiet and their fights are gentle, right? So I know that my Winnie, right? She's laying on the floor right now. When she gets to go and she gets to see um, her friends, Rory and Norm, um, which are two dogs that she knows, when she plays with them, sometimes, right, their playing can get a little aggressive. They like to bite and they like to wrestle, right? But that's just play. So our dogs, right, are domesticated. They're dogs that we have here in our homes that live with us. But we know a long time ago, that wasn't the case for dogs, right? Dogs roamed around and are often descendants from wolves, right? So that's where some of that play fighting comes from. Now our dogs don't have to fight to protect themselves, but it's, so it's just a way that they play and get to have fun with other dogs. Some animals have a lot of babies at once. A rabbit can have a litter of as many as 14 babies. Isn't that crazy? Whereas other animals have just one baby to look after. A horse usually has one baby at a time, and a baby horse is called a foal. Now we know that humans oftentimes have one baby, but sometimes they can have two, three, or more, right? So, kind of in the middle there. When the animals grow up, they will have babies of their own. There will be more animal babies to care for. This cheetah is looking after her new babies called cubs. What's your favorite animal? Hmm. Now looking at this picture, it kind of reminds me of some of those new little baby cheetahs we have at the zoo, right? They were born not too long ago, just a, about a year or two ago. Have you been to the zoo to see them? They're pretty cool. Hmm. Now, do you have a favorite baby animal? Hmm. I like a lot of baby animals, but I do think baby puppies might be one of my favorite. Now, here are some ideas for some things that you could do. I want to share with you because the author has some really cool ideas for some ways to continue your learning. You can make a mask of the face of your favorite animal baby. Decorate a paper plate with paint, cotton balls, yarn, or anything that you can find to make the animal's baby face look just like the real thing. You can draw or paint a picture or cut out pictures to make a collage of your favorite animal baby. Or you can create a word cloud of animal babies. Add the names of all the different animal babies you can think of. Write them all down using different colored pens. Start like this. So we have cub, joey, puppy, right? And then we can see we're back at the end to the glossary. So today we read the book, Amazing Animal Babies, and that's an informational book, right? The author is trying to give you information or teach you something. So in this book, we were able to learn about animal babies and the ways in which they grow up, right? How they're born, how they get their food, how their families protect them from predators. We learned so much new information, right? And so you might have read this book if, or you might want to go out and reread it again if you're gonna do a presentation about animal babies and about how animals grow up. You might have wanted to read this book if you went to the zoo one day. Maybe you wonder, hmm, I wonder why that mom does that, right? Why does that mama elephant choose to do that? A book like this can definitely help answer some of those questions. So I hope that today you were able to learn some new information. And I'm gonna challenge you, okay? This is kind of a big challenge, that the next time you go to the library, right? Either the library at your school or the public library, think about a question you have 
or think about a topic you want to learn about, right? Whether that be more information about a specific animal, whether that be information about maybe a future job that you would like to have or a country that you would like to visit or you want to learn about a famous person, right? Try and find a book on that topic. Now, librarians at our libraries are so helpful. And they have tools there that they can show you how to use to help you find a book that's gonna help either give you the information you need or answer the question that you have, right? So use them as a resource because they're amazing resources, okay? There are so many nonfiction books out there that can teach you so many things. And I know that oftentimes when we go to the library, we look towards fiction books. I do that too. But I'm gonna challenge you to try and find one nonfiction book that can help to teach you some new information and see where you go from there. You might wanna check out a second, a third, a fourth book to help answer more questions or learn more information as you start to learn more. It's really kind of eye-opening right? The possibilities are endless when you read nonfiction books. So boys and girls, I hope that you learned a little bit more today as we continue to talk about author's purpose, right? The reason why authors choose to write books. So far, we've covered persuasion and information. Come back tomorrow to see another reason why authors choose to write books. Bye, everybody. Have a great night. Teaching in Room 9 is made possible with support of Bank of America, Dana Brown Charitable Trust, Emerson, and viewers like you.